Do, do, do. And welcome back to the More Money Podcast. This is your host, Jessica Morehouse. And this is episode 397 of the show. And we are currently, if you're listening to this when it first drops, in, in tax season, full on tax season. We're actually just a few weeks away from that uh, personal income tax season uh, deadline. So make sure to do your taxes. And to talk about that, but so much more, I have CPA Jamie Monty on the show. She is the founder of Chill Books, and you can find her at jamiemonte.com. I will link to it in the show notes, so don't worry about all of that. But I met her maybe a few months ago. There was kind of a get-together with some local um, financial content creators, and we started chatting, and I love talking about taxes, and she really knows her stuff, especially when it comes to if you have a small business, you're a solo printer or a sole proprietor, and I get questions like that all the time because I have some videos on my YouTube channel about being a sole proprietor and taxes and get little literally I get questions about how to do it you know should I do sales tax or like when do I have to register or how do I register a business all this kind of stuff I get questions every single day about it. And so I thought I would actually have an accountant come on the show and answer some of those really important questions that uh, people have. And then also talk about what are some kind of updates that you should know uh, about your personal income taxes. So we have lots to talk about, but also I want to let you know she has, and this is something that I'm going to now tell people um, about because this is a great resource. And she has a lot of great free resources on her website, but she also has a course called Chill Books, which is literally something that would have helped me and I would have avoided a lot of expensive mistakes in my business if I had if it existed when I started my business um, over seven years ago. And so if you wanted to enroll, all you have to do is go to jessicamorehouse.com slash chill books. And again, I will link to this in the show notes and you can find the show notes at jessicamorehouse.com slash 397. But not only that, you can get a $50 off discount if you use my special code Jessica making it very easy for you to remember. My name is Jessica. So again, that's jessicamorehouse.com slash chillbooks. If you want to learn how to do your own bookkeeping and just get your business set up properly so you don't make any mistakes. Uh, With that, we have a lot to get through in this episode. So let's get to that interview. Welcome to the More Money Podcast, Jamie. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes. So we met uh, a little while ago when I found out what you did. I'm like, I need to have you on the show. Um, And tell me a little bit about your background, though. So you're a CPA. I know a lot of what you do and what you share online is very focused on um, obviously taxes, but specifically for small uh, business owners, solo printers, uh, things like that. How did you get into that? Yeah, I uh, first started my career in corporate. So I was working on the back end in a lot of like marketing and media companies, helping them to kind of keep their numbers together and report on their profitability and stuff like that. And then um, eventually I I felt like I wanted some more flexibility in, in my life. And so that's when I decided to go off on my own. Um, but I didn't have, really have a plan. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I was like, I'm a CPA. Everybody asks me to file their taxes. So I'm going to start doing that since that yeah. seems to be in demand. So I started filing taxes and I had a lot of self-employed people coming to me for filing. And I, because I had not come from the big four firms and I hadn't come from any, even a small firm filing, I was shocked at what people were bringing me come tax Mm. time. Like I thought, this is not what I learned in school. Like, what do you mean? Like you don't have a profit and loss statement to share with me. You don't have, you don't know how much money you made last year. Like it was very, Cause I just thought everybody that runs a business knows that they're supposed to be doing bookkeeping through the year and have financial <laughs> reporting. And yeah. so that was a moment for me where I was like, there's something, there's something missing here. And specifically solo printers, small businesses, they are, um, they're really getting left out of the, the mix because they're not yeah. hiring staff to do this for them. Um, but also they don't have the education they need. So that's when I started yeah. to focus on educating entrepreneurs on all of the things that they need to be doing year round, whether or not they have an accountant. And that's how I started my course, Chill Books, which teaches bookkeeping and financial found the financial foundation for entrepreneurs. Yeah, no, super helpful. Um, And I want to really launch into that. But before, just because we are 
very much uh, approaching uh, kind of the the personal income tax um, deadline, and you do a great job of sharing some really great tips and information on your Instagram that I I love to follow now. Um, Is there anything personal tax wise that people should be aware of? Any new updates and new things? I get asked all the time, is there any new credits? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not an accountant. (laughs) And so I do some Googling, but I'm like, I don't, this isn't my world. <laughs> well, I have some good news. And that is that the the, the tax brackets have increased. And yes. yes, so what that means is by nature, when you're filing your taxes, you might find yourself in a lower tax bracket this year, just because That's good. them being increased might push you down into a lower bracket. So we love that. We also love that the federal basic uh, personal amount has been increased as well. And what that means is that that's kind of like your tax-free amount that you make in the year. Yep. So yep. in Canada, the federal basic personal amount, so this for federal taxes is now 15, 15,000. So, so again, these are things that you're going to naturally see when you file your taxes. Yeah. You don't have to remember to do anything special. Um, work from the, a lot of the COVID benefits are no more, yep. um, which we love. COVID is a distant memory for, for Thank most, goodness. I hope, I hope, I know some people are, <laughs> I know, I hope, COVID oh my gosh, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> but, but I mean, anyways, we just, it doesn't have the same ring to it anymore. So the government's like no yep. more with these uh, tax credits. So, so the Ontario staycation credit, is no more. Um, the work from home flat rate. I know a lot of people love that flat rate $500 um, deduction. Now, if you do want to claim work from home, because I know a lot of people are still working from home, you just need to go through a more detailed um, method of reporting and, and getting getting clear with your employer that you are in fact required to, to work from home. So those are some things that um, to keep in mind this, I think, cause I think some people might've filed already. Some people might not, but knowing that the, for this year, the RSP cap has been increased as well and the TFSA limits also. So that's some nice stuff just to yep. think about in planning for, for 2024. I'm sure you've probably chatted about this on here. Yeah. So we don't need to go too much into detail, but, but, um, but yeah, those are some of the, the major changes. And then, um, something that people might start to see in 2024 is they, is more CPP being deducted off their paychecks. So we like to think about that as money coming back to us at some point. Exactly. I've seen a lot of um, people talk about it online. And then when I looked into it, I'm like, well, how much extra CPP is like very minimal. But how people are talking about it, it's like it's X thousands and thousands of dollars extra you're paying for years. Like it's really not. It's like very minimal. So relax. And it's not. A, that's the thing I hate when people say, oh, the CPP tax. I'm like, it's not really a tax. You get it back. You know what I mean? Whereas a tax you pay to the government and we don't know what they're going to do with that. Exactly. <laughs> so it's coming back to you. Yes, I know. And I think like we have been feeling the increase of CPP since 2019. The government has been increasing it every year because they're trying to make sure that we have enough money when we retire. And this is an amount that's meant to supplement our income when we do retire. So, so you're probably not going to feel it any more than you have in previous years, especially because the base base amount didn't go up. It's that there's an additional ceiling been added, but I know that my self-employed friends, which we can talk about this, they, a lot of times it's a big surprise for them because they start they have to pay both the employee and the employer portion. And if it's your That's first right. year filing, then that yeah. can feel like a punch in the face. Mm-hmm. But yeah, just think of it as this isn't a bad thing. Because wasn't it that, you know, with this enhancement, it, it, in the end, you'll end up with like a significantly, I, I, I'm going to get it wrong, but like 50% more or, or is like it was a pretty high percentage more by contributing more. I I. I don't know the yeah. answer. Every time yeah. I try to look into how much money I'm going to get yeah. from CPP down the line, it's like this big confusing rigmarole. Yeah. So I, just, <laughs> I don't want to talk about it no. because I feel yeah. it's Fair enough. But I think, yeah, if you look it up, I, there are some like stats out there that do show because we're increasing this uh, the CPP amount, you are going to see more when you retired, which is a really good thing. Mm-hmm. And the reason they're doing this is because in general, Canadians are very bad at saving on their own. So it's a bit of forced savings. Uh, a little bit there. Yes. Okay, those are super helpful things for people to keep in mind. So now let's kind of talk more about being self-employed. I uh, over the past, like since I became self-employed, 
which is now seven years ago, which is crazy. I made a few videos on my YouTube channel about this because I had no guidance either. I I think it took me a good few years to maybe, maybe another, maybe after one year of doing it on my own, I'm like, oh, I can't do this. I need to hire. <laughs> I, can't. I need an account. Um, but I was shocked at how little I knew about yeah, bookkeeping and and all the reports that you need. And uh, it was very hard to find the information or the information that was out there was very hard to understand. Mm -hmm. And so I started kind of creating some uh, pieces of content just based off my experience. And to this day, I have videos that are super old, like four plus years old. And I get comments every single day be like, hey, how does this work? Da, 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 da. And I'm like, Gee, if this many people are asking, that just means how confusing it is. And I think part of it is, We've definitely seen an influx of people start a side hustle, start a small business, become self-employed because they're unhappy with their uh, career and they want to try something new, which is great. There's so many people, uh, I, I feel like, especially on social media, talking about like, work for yourself. And then the information stops it. But how do I actually do that in terms of making sure my business financials are set up properly. These people do not talk about that. And maybe it's because yes. it's a bit intimidating or confusing or the, yeah, I mean, these people talking about how to make money from home so not, certainly are not accountants. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, if someone is thinking about becoming a sole proprietor, whether that's on the side of their day job or quitting their day job and doing this full time, what is one of the first things that they should know to make sure they set up that, you know, foundation like you mentioned? So the first thing that I would say is I think that and I've made this mistake myself and it's to take your business finances seriously from day one, even when you feel yeah. like it's just a little thing I'm doing. Uh, it's not a big deal. I don't know how it's the the thing is is these things compound so i'll i'll tell you that in my first year of business as a cpa i didn't have much direction and actually my first year was a partial year um and i did a cons i had a consulting role so i took on a consulting gig and i was working like three or, three or four days a week with that for a few months and so i had one client yeah and i thought I don't need to worry about bookkeeping and stuff, especially. Yeah. You're like, what's yeah. my client? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Right. I'm like, it's literally one client. I have like two write-offs. Like it's just, yeah. and I'm a CPA so I can wrap this stuff up quick time mm -hmm. at the end of the year. Yeah. And so I did what I tell everybody not to do is I went and I downloaded wave, which is like a free bookkeeping yep. software. And that's where I did my invoicing for my one client. And then I totally left the ta taxes to the last minute. And because I wasn't taking it seriously, I'm like, Oh, it's gonna be so easy. I know what I'm doing. And uh, until I found myself on vacation, well, actually, I was doing yoga teacher training. So I was in Bali for like a month and a half. And I realized, oh my God, I'm going to be in Bali for the tax deadline. And I didn't do it yet. So I remember sitting, <laughs> like facing the jungle in Ubud, and people are yeah. like lounging by the pool. And I'm hunched over over my laptop trying to add up all of my numbers for the year for my car because I used my car for work um, for random subscriptions like searching for like where do, how did I pay Microsoft for my Microsoft Word subscription um, or like my my whatever the suite is that it's called and oh yeah I think I actually bought this in February I need to look yeah back. and so I had to download all of my statements for the year for my bank and credit card look through them then go to find the receipts and then I and then filed last minute, literally like final day while I was on a trip. And it was a disaster because I didn't have a system that was holding all the yeah. information in one place for me. And that was one mm -hmm. client and a service based role. So mm -hmm. please do not take, do not push your, the financial management to the side because also the easiest time to get on top of it is when you start. So exactly. Yeah. Take it seriously, get the education you need, set up a system or hire a bookkeeper. Don't leave it to the end of the year because especially, you know, when, when you're not a CPA and taxes are a bit of a mystery to you, then you have to go through that learning process while you're trying to do your bookkeeping for the whole year. So yes. yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you think it's a good idea for people to start doing their own bookkeeping first before hiring someone just so they start to understand how it works? Because I know even in just 
personal finance, you know, think about investing. A lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to take the time to learn how to do this on my own. Can I just hand it off to someone? I'm like, sure you can. But then you're not going to know if they're doing it right. And then years will go by and you're like, why are my returns low? I'm like, yeah, it's because you didn't know what they were investing your money in. Do you think it's a good thing to get some hands-on experience before hiring someone to help you? Absolutely. 150%. I really think that there's there's also that piece of even when you do get to the point of outsourcing it, you're not going to know what you're supposed yeah. to be looking at and what you're asking questions about. And so take time to understand the foundation yourself, because one, it if you get the right education, <laughs> then it might be actually a lot easier for you than outsourcing, because a lot of times from the, in the bookkeeping and financial management realm, when you're just starting out, you're already doing most of the bookkeeping yourself because you're the one invoicing your clients. You're the one spending the money on expenses. You know where your receipts are. You are managing the bank accounts. Like you're already, ba you have all the tools for you to hand yep. that to someone else. And then they have questions and they come back to you for the questions. You're like, why don't you just interact directly with the system at that point, right? So, so yeah, it's going to, it might actually save you save you time too at the start when early on and um and yeah you're going to feel a lot more empowered you care more about capturing all your write-offs than any bookkeeper is going to care oh yeah it's the common challenge with being an entrepreneur no one cares about your business as much as you do and when it comes to your finances same thing applies when you have a bookkeeper their job if they're managing things for you their job is to um, is to get things in order from a compliance standpoint and just do it in the most efficient way possible so that they're not bugging you. And yeah, so yeah. that can mean a lot of assumptions are made and things are missed. And yeah, inside one of my workshops last week, somebody came to check on, they, they had hired a bookkeeper for the year and they were kind of like, I just want to check the numbers. And they found thousands of dollars, literally thousands of dollars of missing write-offs because they decided, I don't want to do this myself. I just want to hand it off. But again, no one cares as much as you do about, yeah. about your numbers. So learn, be empowered. And yeah. you might even, you're going to save, you might even save yourself some time and money in outsourcing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got to say, I've been using a bookkeeper for the past, like I, I did the majority of my own bookkeeping for maybe five years. And I think it's only in the past two, maybe three years that I've had a bookkeeper. Number one, it's not necessarily cheap. So you've got, also, you've got to think about the cost involved, right? Yes. Um, but I, yeah, I've definitely become more passive. I used to be, I know every single dollar that was accounted for. And now I'm like, I, I probably should check my QuickBooks and really just, you know, see what's going on there before... We file some of those returns, actually. <laughs> actually, I'm like, did we already file my corporate tax? I don't know. Maybe not. I'm going to have to check. Look, I do have an accountant and a bookkeeper. But yeah, that is one of those things where it's like, I, I kind of miss being as involved as I used to because I really knew what was going on. And now I, I still keep track of things. You know, For instance, like even though I have QuickBooks and, and, and things connected and the system, I do also have a little spreadsheet for, you know, some of the campaigns that I work on and stuff. So I've got all that. But yeah, I, I have become a little bit passive and I wonder whether there's something missing. And that's the thing. It's like you got it. You still need to always be involved in your business finances, no matter if you're outsourcing uh, or not. Um, talking about systems a little bit more, that is, I think, one of the hardest things for people to figure out. Mm -hmm. And for me, again, it's it was a lot of trial and error. I think I didn't use bookkeeping software for a year or two. I used a spreadsheet and it worked for me at the time. And then it became really cumbersome. And so I think the first software I used was FreshBooks, which served me well as a solo or a sole proprietor. And then I switched to QuickBooks once I incorporated just because it was, I needed something a little bit more comprehensive. Now, in your mind, when um, someone is, you know, again, starting their business, or maybe they've been doing business for a while, and they're like, the system is not working because I have no system. What is, what are some things that people should put in place to keep things organized? Like, you know, one thing that's really helped me is have a separate bank account, have a separate credit card, because when you commingle it with your personal stuff, it gets complicated. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And this is one of the like, not taking things seriously is like, I don't have I'm just starting out, I don't need a separate account. If you do nothing else. <laughs> yeah, do that. <laughs> do that. Because then at least you have everything 
in one account and you'll you won't have to sort through e-transfers and think oh was this me e-transferring my friend or was this me paying for a random expense that i forgot about so have all of those business transactions in a separate business bank account um and and ideally a separate credit card um it doesn't have to be your business credit card because maybe you can't get credit with your business yet you can just use a personal credit card and designate that as your business credit card that's still going to help you a ton um in terms of keeping things organized from from a bookkeeping standpoint um and also on on that uh on that note is remember that your bank accounts and your credit card statements don't count as documentation for writing off your business expenses you need to keep receipts or some sort of documentation for anything that you're spending money on in order to run your business and uh yeah that's going to make sure you're not getting yourself into trouble come tax time which is why bookkeeping system that's what part of what bookkeeping systems do i think people don't realize yeah. it's like yeah we'll house those receipts for you <laughs> so that if you're audited six years from now you could just click a few buttons in your quickbooks and then go back to see but no matter yeah. what kept get those separate bank accounts and keep receipts for everything that you are spending money on. Mm -hmm. and, and remember, like some of those receipts are digital and some are paper-based. And for the paper-based ones, believe me, I've had receipts where I'm like, this is great. And then it's like illegible. You cannot read it. Take a photo. <laughs> Take yeah. a photo because the CRA does not care that the ink has faded. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. So get that. Do that. And then a tip for the the on the receipts front, I see this mistake a lot is meals and entertainment. Ah. Um, yeah. So make sure that when you're going out to eat, maybe you're taking a potential client out that you're keeping both the itemized receipt, which is shows like yes. what you ordered and the tax that you paid and the credit card or debit receipt that shows the tip because those two together document the full cost of what of what you're claiming so if you just get the the debit or credit receipt that is not actually going to hold up in an audit because it doesn't have the information of what you purchased exactly and i guess uh, speaking to that because i get a lot of questions about this if you are doing yeah like a, a meal with the client is there anything that cannot be included like is alcohol that's one of those things that you're not allowed to include is that correct or no you're absolutely allowed to include alcohol. oh are you yes. i thought you could oh good to know <laughs> i think a lot of us that come from the corporate world might might be mistaking um rules about what you can write off for company rules mm, versus mm, yeah maybe <laughs> that's maybe that's what i'm thinking <laughs> when i used to work at one of our one of the media agencies i remember we had specific clients who we would bill back our meals to like if we were traveling on behalf of that client and they had a policy oh you can't write off yeah. drinks so then we'd be like okay whenever you're dining out under this client we can't bill back the drinks so don't do it so maybe it's something i think that some might be it yeah i was always like yeah. resistant to like ordering a drink when i was out with like some sort of business purpose because i was afraid i couldn't write it off but that's probably where i got it confused yeah, um but it yeah. Um, but yeah, speaking of write-offs, this is another big question I get is, um, I mean, obviously there's a huge list that is available publicly on this area website that anyone could look at to get a sense of what you can and cannot write off. But I think, again, people get very, it's, it's an overwhelmingly long list. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that people should really just always remember in the back of their mind? You can write this off. Maybe, maybe make sure to keep that receipt. Mm, yes. Okay. First of all, little plug i do have a solopreneur write-off guide for oh, great that that goes into um a little bit more digestible than the cra yeah website. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a ridiculous so, long list. yeah so we can link <laughs> that if you want to grab yeah. that and um first one that i see people miss a lot is and just because of random organization issues is their cell phone bill so oh yeah yes. exactly it's like you were most likely using that for your business yeah i actually almost forgot this year about that because I because it's not connected to 
my QuickBooks, but then, you know, I'm using my account for my personal and corporate taxes and I almost forgot about my cell phone bill. And I'm like, how could I, how could I have done that? I use it all the time and it's mainly for business. (laughs) (laughs) It's those mixed, it's the mixed business personal things that when, even when you have a solid system, it's like, you need to make sure that there, you know, what's living outside of that system. So yeah, that's why cell phone gets missed a lot. Um, and then in terms of home, home office, that's another one that's mixed personal business. You're not going to be putting, I, well, at least I don't teach my students to put their home office expenses into their QuickBooks because I'm like, it's going to throw off your numbers. You're not going to see yeah. if you're actually profitable and you don't like, it's confusing to put in the percentage. So just keep it outside. And so when, when it comes to home office expenses, I think ones that people sometimes miss are, um, claiming a portion of their mortgage interest. Yes. Mm-hmm. And not to be confused with the full mortgage payment, but I wish we could write that off. <laughs> Right? Nope. Like, yeah. <laughs> my, my, yeah. It's ridiculous, the cost of living these days. So, oh, yeah. But, mm-hmm. but get that statement at the end of the year from your bank. Maybe it's sitting in your on your banking site right now in your PDF documents, and it will outline how much interest. And then another one is... Um, either cleaning, uh, cleaning staff or cleaning supplies. You've got to clean your office. Hmm, <laughs> so I never thought of that. <laughs> if you have a cleaning service coming in to clean your home once every two weeks or, you know, however often I'm not judging, then get the receipts for that because you can claim the percentage that relates to your home office. Me and my husband both work at home. I've never even thought, because I'm like, oh man, wouldn't it be great if we could hire someone just a few times per year to do a little deep clean and that we could potentially write off some of that. Oh my God, I'm going to tell him right now. That's yes. so exciting. Right? <laughs> just like Yeah, in, it's like, oh great. Now there's enough. a little, I love a little tax, you know, credit or, or deduction that I can utilize for anything. Like that makes me so excited. <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely. Why not? Right. And it, maybe we just need that little extra knowing that it's a write off to, to be able to put it in the budget. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And even just the mortgage interest. I'm like, I'm going to, because I'm literally in the, the moment of, of of the taxes right now with my accountant. I'm like, I can't remember if I sent him that document. I'm going to have to triple check because that mm-hmm. is a good chunk of change, that mortgage interest, let me tell you. Yes. <laughs> it's, all, it's pretty much all interest right now. <laughs> so. Mine too. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly it. You see it, you're like, ick, but at least I'm getting an Yeah, you're like, great. I'm going to be paying this till I'm dead. But that's great. That's okay. <laughs> um, um, so, so yeah, that's super helpful. Um, and yeah, definitely, uh, I think people should uh, grab a copy of that guide. That's super, um, very, very helpful. One other question I get, so sort of related to taxes, but not income taxes, but this is where I feel like there's so much confusion, is sales tax. Sales tax, it trips people up. And it's like, even for me, I've been sharing this info for years. Even for me, I'm like, I get a question. I'm like, let me Google that first. (laughs) Just to make sure. But like, for example, I got a question from somebody being like, hey, I have a YouTube channel. I'm earning AdSense. Do I have to charge sales tax? I'm like, well, number one, there's no way to do that because they just pay you automatically. And then, but... I had to do like a few years back, did a deep dive and found out that you need to find out who like which branch or whatever is paying you. If it's U.S. based, then you don't. But I looked like recently because I got a comment. I'm like, there was some, you know, and then I had to look through my comments to, from years ago to find that reference. But otherwise, I went on Google. There was not, I couldn't find anything. So I'm like, geez, if someone, you know, how many YouTubers are out there? A lot. So they're like, do I have to charge sales tax? I don't want to get in trouble. But that is, it's just like, I find sales tax specifically is very complicated for most people. And the information out there is not easy to understand. So anything you can share about how to get started, re- like when you should you register? And then there's all the provincial ones. And you're like, which one do I do? Am I doing this right? I'm so happy you brought this up. Because this <laughs> is an area that exactly like you said, there's yeah. so many so much confusion and so many mistakes being made. And first off, I just want to validate it is complex. Yeah. Um, because like you said, there are so many rules that are dependent on where you are, where your client is, where the product is, where in the product exchanges hands. It's a bit of a thing. So, um, but we'll, we're going to simplify it for, for some, some basic things to keep in mind is first and foremost is when to register. And you register when you've made $30,000 
or more. Well, you know, you want to register when you, when you break that $30,000 mark over four consecutive quarters. So that could be like, you know, a typical uh, calendar year, but also it's a rolling four quarters. So if you have a really great Q1 and really great Q2, and then it's like, okay, I hit the 30,000 mark. I need to start, start collecting now. So that's first thing, keep an eye on your sales and that is worldwide sales. So that's something that I think is not clear to some people. Like, what if I'm selling part in the U.S. and they're not paying tax? Yeah, and they're exempt. It doesn't count. And yeah, I I find that's really confusing for people. Yes. So when in doubt, (laughs) just make sure you register because even if you register and then you don't have to charge to certain clients, you're still going to have your bases covered to make sure you don't you don't want to you don't want to register late and then have to go back in time and charge to the people that you were supposed to charge or take a cut of your sales by just giving that money to the CRA. So check for that 30,000 mark. Um, The other thing to keep in mind is once you're registered, it's your responsibility to check with every sale what you're supposed to be charging. That's what you're talking about with the YouTube, I think you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Is Mm -hmm. it's like, sometimes we might think, oh, we're dealing with these big companies, they're going to know what to do. It's our responsibility to know what we're supposed to be charging to who and when. And the basic thing I want you to keep in mind is if you don't know what you should be charging, charge your local rate. So if you're in Ontario, that's HST. If you're in BC, that would be GST default to the rate that is based in where uh, where you are because that's the right that's the rule when you don't know (laughs) great rule (laughs) (laughs) so if you're like i don't know i don't have time to figure this stuff out jamie then default to your local rate because you you're not going to get in trouble for doing that um and uh, because the cra just wants you to collect tax on their behalf they are happy if you do your local rate that's the rule too if you don't know where your client is based you default to the local rate um, now in Canada, GST and HST, um, so HST stands for harmonized sales tax and GST stands for, oh my God, now I'm, I'm drunk. No, you were saying that. I'm like, I don't remember. Yeah. Now I'm like, what Never, is it? <laughs> I'm going to Google it. We're going to cut this out. Hold on. <laughs> what does GST stand for? It's been too long. Goods and services oh God, tax. Yes. How did I say Okay. That? Let's start that one again. <laughs> I can remember. I'm like, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I'd failed that exam. <laughs> <laughs> so HST stands for harmonized sales tax and GST is goods and service tax. So harmonized sales tax means that you you might be, if your province has HST, it means that your provincial um, sales tax and the goods and service tax, the GST, are combined. They're harmonized mm-hmm. together. Yeah. So in Ontario, that looks like 13%. But then in some provinces, like I mentioned in BC, the, the goods and service tax is separate from the provincial sales tax. And why I'm bringing this up is, is that um, depending on where you're registered, you can think about GST or HST as kind of the same thing. Even though they seem different, they'll go on the same same return. And once you're registered in your province for either GST or HST, then you're able to collect GST or HST in the other provinces, depending on what their their rates are. So don't think that, oh, I I registered for HST, but what about when I sell to BC, do I have to register for GST? No, you can just charge your client in BC 5% if that's what you're supposed to be charging. Um, but it, it gets complicated. I do have also a guide It's called what the HST am I doing? It's free. Ooh, oh, good. <laughs> it goes into what rates to charge in what provinces, what rates to charge to your U S clients. And there's even a tracker to help you track your, your GST. I'm going to download that. That's really helpful. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> it took me forever to figure yeah. out that cause I had, 
you know, some digital downloads and I did services across the country. And then I'm like, wait, do I have to? And I did. I registered in every province The the you know, there's PST, QST, yes, QST. RST. And I'm like, I just want to make sure I'm doing it right. But I'm like, this is way too complicated. This shouldn't be this difficult. And that's what most people feel like. They're like, so just because I, you know, yeah, offer some service to people across the Canada, I have to like think about all these different provincial taxes. I'm like, potentially. But that's also mm-hmm. the other thing is figuring out, do I actually have to charge PST? GST and GST or not. Yeah. Yes. It's the, the provincial sales tax and the, the QST, the Quebec sales tax. Um, generally, what if you are not in the province that has the PST, what I tell people is is when is to keep an eye on the volume of your sales in that province. Yeah. If you start to make a high volume of sales, like if it's just one sale, you know, yeah. let's not, let's not have to hire a tax accountant and register. Yeah. It's when you start to have a high volume of sales or if you're particularly targeting that region with your marketing, then if down the line, somebody says, Hey, you should have been charging PST. You're like, I don't know. They're like, well, you've been advertising in this province for months now. So, so if you're specifically targeting a province that has PST, then start, then make sure to look into it right away. Otherwise, if you have a few sales here and there from different provinces, wait until you have some more volume and then you can look into like, should I do QST or PST? And I guess the other thing too, is when you're thinking about you know, whether it's a service or a product you're selling, whatever checkout cart that you're using to make sure that it is also collecting that sales tax. Because for mm-hmm. years, I used this one for this course that I sold and it's and it's based in Vancouver, but they did not have a mechanism to charge sales tax. So I had to find a roundabout way mm-hmm. to do it because they're like, oh, it's tax inclusive. I'm like, no, that just means that I'm making less money. <laughs> yes. Because, you you know, you're not going to charge like a weird you know number. You want to have an even number. And now they they do have that because the government's like, you have to include this. We want our sales tax because uh, I think a lot of people probably weren't doing it right. But that's the other thing when you're looking for a checkout card, especially if it's like U.S. based and they don't really count for Canadian taxes. You want it, it will just make your accounting so and your bookkeeping so much easier if it, it does that automatically. Yes, yes. And these huge brands like Kajabi, for example, I know people love Kajabi. Jobby doesn't separate sales tax. Mm-mm. Yeah, no, that's it. That's like, a re- I can't do that. I Won't can't, do right? Mm-mm. Like you want your system, if you're selling in volumes online, you want to have a system that takes your customer's name, legal name and address, and then adds a tax based on that. That's what Exactly. You- and there's lots of great ones now. Like for years, I used one that was like the only one I could find that existed called Quaderno. It's all right. Um, but like Shopify, they do that. Think of it now does that. So yeah, when yeah. you're searching for right. which platform should I use for whatever, find one that also makes your life easier when it comes to bookkeeping, because yeah. it's not fun trying to like separate those amounts. Oh my God. No. Yeah. The hours you'll be spending. No. <laughs> um, I want to kind of um, move on and and talk another, you know, um, a bunch of questions I get is how do I register for a business? Registering is also compl- complicated, I think, mm. depending on if you want to like, for example, when I started, you know, doing some like freelance writing and stuff on top of my day job, I was just a, automatically is under my regular name, sole proprietor, didn't have to register for anything. But then I realized I actually don't want to use my personal name. I want to use my brand name, which is a different last name. So I had to register. Um, but again, it depends on what province you live in. And yeah, if you want to have a different name, do you want to kind of speak to what does registering a business actually mean? Mm. So I will speak to it from a CPA standpoint yeah. rather than a legal standpoint. Yeah. That's yeah, what yeah, I yeah. Would say is that and and what I've seen is is there's um so when you first start your business, like if you're just starting out and you're billing things under your own name, you're like, I don't know what what's going on, I'm just collecting money for sales right now. <laughs> then um then from a tax standpoint. The CRA is like, great, cool. Do you just make sure to tell us how much money you collected and put it on your personal tax return and you're good to go. But then what happens is if you're like, hey, my name is Jamie and actually I am collecting money under the name Chill Books, 
which is the name of my course. And I um, start to bill, bill under that name then I need to have a master business license, which I can get in. in, So I'm familiar with the Ontario one, which like you can get it from the Ontario Service Ontario website and uh, and just register the fact that I'm operating my sole proprietorship. We'll just say in this example, uh, Jamie, Jamie Monty under a name chill books, which is not which is different from my legal name. So then once you incorporate your business, When you incorporate your business, then you actually pick a name for that incorporated business. So let's say I now incorporate my business and it's Monty International Inc., but I still want to bill my clients as chill books. Then I need to make sure that I register that chill books name still as a name that Monty International is doing business as. Now, the, the, I don't, know the exact website or how you would do it, but I know that you need to register doing business as. So it's really when your legal name is not matching the name that you're selling and doing business under. Because yeah, also, not from not that I'm a lawyer, but also you want to make sure your contracts are protecting the right entity. If I, my contracts say chill books, but yet I don't even, I don't have a business license for chill books and something happens, like it's going to come to me, not to, to, chill books and also there is no contract then because there's no legal legal entity doesn't exist but yeah it sounds so simple when you say it but most people are like i'm so confused and yeah it's not (laughs) i i I think it's because it's also a little bit different depending on what province um which is uh, super annoying Uh, one resource that i always tell people because there's just a lot of great articles on it is owner and they make it easy to register yeah yeah it's a little bit of money like you could do it i guess you know for cheaper if you just go through the you know provincial web you know website and stuff like that but uh, if you want something a little bit easier but again also they just have a lot of articles about province to province, how things kind of differ. So that might be a resource people want to um, check out. Now, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, for like small business owners who are just getting started, what are some big mistakes or little mistakes that you see quite often that people should try to avoid? So the first one I would say is just to touch back on that GST, Mm -hmm. HST is they register for sales tax and then they don't realize that it's actually a separate filing from their personal. Yes, I, I've gotten that question. Like, so when do I file this with my income taxes? I'm like, you don't No, They're totally different. And I guess we should also clarify, too, because I get this question often, too, is it will it should not affect your bottom line, your revenue. And I think a lot of people are afraid. I don't want to register because I don't want to earn less money. That's not at all right. Correct. Absolutely. That's such a good I hear this all the time too. I've heard people who specifically want to keep their sales under 30,000 because they don't want to register. And you're like, that doesn't make any sense. You should want to make as much money as your business can. Like, (laughs) yeah, this is a real thing though, because taxes are a mystery for a lot to a lot of people. And so they're just like, I just don't want to complicate things. I know this is going to complicate things. And um, so definitely if this is you, grab the guide because it's going to yeah. help you and give you, you can kind of review it and, and really sink into what it means. But tax, like like you said, you add it on top of what your sales is. So if I'm selling something for $100, once I register for sales tax, I'm in Ontario, my rate is 13%, then I start charging my clients $113 instead of $100. So same $100 is coming to me. And, mm-hmm. the and then you give that $13 to the government. You don't get it. It's not extra revenue, but it's also not. So it's costing the customer something. <laughs> exactly. But yes. But if you. your customers are businesses that are registered yeah. for sales tax as well. Then on the flip side, they get that $13 in that example. They get to claim that as a credit at the end of the year if your clients are businesses. If your client- and you're talking about input tax credits, which again is a big mystery to people. Yes, yes, exactly. Is is as soon as I like to tell people that when you register for GST or HST, you're now acting as an agent on behalf of the CRA. And your job as an agent is to go around and collect your tax rate, whatever it is, I'm 13%, I'm going to collect 13% from every client that I sell a good or service to. And then what happens is because you're an agent, you also get agent benefits, which means you don't have to pay that 13% on your business expenses if they're if like they are business expenses related to your business. So that means that say I were to go to Jessica and purchase something from Jessica and she charged me 
$113, 13 of that being tax, then I get to go back to the CRA at the end of the year and say, look, I paid Jessica $13, but that was actually related to my business. And I'm registered, I'm acting as an agent on behalf of the CRA. So I get that $13 back. That's an input tax credit. The, the net of it is you you take however much sales tax you collected in the year, and then you are supposed to give that back to the government. But you also get credits for all the sales tax the GSC or HSC you spent on your business. So you get to remove that from what you give back at the end. So another kind of incentive, like business expenses are great because there's the deductions, but then also on top of that, there's the input tax credit. So do not forget about that. But again, another really great reason and important reason why you should be doing your bookkeeping, keeping those receipts so you can keep track of all the sales tax that you've been paying that can you can maybe claim back and get back in your pocket. But again, it's, it, it takes time. It takes time. But then once you understand the system and the rules, you're like, oh, this isn't so bad. This isn't this is manageable. And it's nice to get some of that money back. <laughs> let me tell you. Yeah. And that's why we have systems is because we don't need to hold all this information in our brain. You basically need to understand it at one point in time while you're implementing your system. And then you just have your monthly rinse and repeat process that this is where I put my receipts. This is how I code things. This is what happens. And then you don't have to really think about it. Um, exactly. And just one thing that, yeah, I want to clarify, because I don't think we touched on this. When it comes to charging sales tax to customers, you did that to Canadian customers, not international customers. So if you have a U.S. customer that's buying a product from you, you're not charging them, you know, HST because they do not live in this country. Yes, with an asterisk, because okay. like I like we know, sales tax um, can be complex. And if you're selling a product, there could be some things to keep in mind. So okay. selling a service. Okay. Then yes. <laughs> so okay. I will just speak to what I'm familiar with is when yeah. I'm selling a service to somebody in the U S and, um, then, and, and this person or client in the U S does not have an, an office in Canada. They don't have a right. Canadian location then I can say I'm only going to charge them. I'm not going to charge them any tax. Yeah, because when you think about it, it's like if I were to buy something or, or a service from someone who is U.S. based, why, you know, and they charge me like their state tax, I'd be like, why am I paying your t- state tax? I don't live there. I yes. don't get Yeah, There's no benefits for me. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, keep in mind. Yeah, it's complex. It's complex. Um, Now, before I let you go, is there anything else, you know, any other kind of popular questions that you you get from people who are in this realm that you want to make sure people know about? Mm. The the one thing that I want to to make sure people know about is installments. And the first year that you're filing your taxes, like and we're talking about income ta- or like the income, income tax, tax installments okay. and or GST, HST installments, corporate corporate income tax, personal income tax, all the taxes, basically. Yeah. <laughs> what happens is when you have your first year of business, a lot of people, they don't put their tax money aside, which you should be. Yes. Um, and uh, and so they have to pay like a hefty amount at the end of the year that they kind of come up with. Well, in April. And then what happens is they're like, I'm not going to do that again. I got to start putting money aside. But also the CRA, depending on how much you owe, they might actually be like, you know what, you're not allowed to keep that money all year round. We want that money in quarterly installments. Yeah, because you're earning it year round. Why do you get to keep it until the end? Of yeah, the and year? earn that interest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if you and this is this is perfect timing for this conversation, because if in 2023, you may you had to pay more than $3,000 in personal income tax related to your business or in GST or HST or in corporate tax, corporate income tax, any of those buckets, then CRA is going to want you to pay installments starting this year because they know that you're going to owe more than $3,000 again next year. And so they want you to start paying them quarterly and they do not shout it from the rooftops they often I know. put it on like one little sentence on your notice of assessment that's like if you owe more than three thousand you need to pay us installments <laughs> i know i know this because i think it was my second year of business that i did not pay in installments and then i it's like oh you owe us interest because you didn't pay on time i'm like what are you talking about thought to pay annually. What are we what are we doing here? And it's because, yeah, I was expecting like a letter or some sort of notification. But is it is typically the information like if you log into your like CRA my account, it will be there. And even still, like if people ask me that, I'm like, I can't remember. <laughs> I don't know if it's there. Yeah. It's it's so 
they do put out reminders in your CRA My Account. But what I but they're like in the messages, you're not, you know, it's like you expect like a proper email, but it's like, no, it's hidden in the messages that you never check. Yes, <laughs> check, exactly. Check your just do the do the numbers yourself. Check your yeah, notice of assessment, yeah. which yeah. is the document that you receive after you're done filing. So you'll receive a notice of assessment for your sales tax and for your your income tax. Check that. See how much money you owed. And then um, and then. Be proactively looking into making sure you're making the installments that you have to make. Um, but know that this is why year two of business can feel very challenging is if you didn't put money aside for first year, yeah. you're basically paying double the second year. Cause you base you paid last year's 20 right now you could pay 2023 stuff. And then you have to start paying 2024 stuff. And you're like, what the heck last year? I, I just paid. So yeah. just, yeah. Raising the flag now do your best. Um, knowing that there's going to be some cash flow management. Maybe you're not going to be able to pay your installments in time and you might pay a little bit of interest, but better to know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, there's clearly so much for people to know, but you mentioned you have a couple of great resources on your website. Where can people find more information about you and some of the great kind of downloadables and courses that you have? Yeah. So I'm very active on Instagram at jamie.monty. So that's where, uh, and Jamie is spelt without an E at the end. And uh, that's where you can see a lot of day-to-day -day stuff and lots of educational, like bite-sized pieces of information. So if this was a lot for you and you want to keep the learning experience up, definitely just hang out with me on my page and, and we'll remind you of things. And then um, HST guide, what the HST am I doing? definitely get that even if like you know Jessica said she might download it it's yeah like, I want to see really what I'm like let's just make sure I'm doing it right, right? you know <laughs> you can always like, there's always more to learn you know <laughs> yes and just to validate because yeah validate. Doing, you're like good I'm doing it right good, oh thank good. god yeah <laughs> it's like nice to know one last thing to stress yeah and uh and then I've got that solopreneur write-off guide if you're just starting out and you want to know what kind of things you can write off that's free as well. But if you're listening to this and you're like, holy crap, there is a lot to keep in mind. And we've just scratched the surface here and you're just starting out or maybe you've just kind of ignored this part of your business for a little bit, but you want to finally get it in order, then highly recommend checking out Chill Books. This is the course that will set you up for success. It'll set up your bookkeeping foundation. I teach you exactly what you need to do from A to Z, from setting up those bank accounts to looking at your financial statements to digitizing your receipts to categorizing separating your sales tax all of that in like a chill way that's why we call yeah. it chill books so yeah. definitely check out chill books because it is going to walk you through everything you need to know in a way that's not going to be overwhelming for you. Amazing. I wish that was around when I started my <laughs> business. Let me tell you, would have made a lot less mistakes. Well, thank you so much, Jamie, for joining me. It was so great having you on. I think you're going to give a lot of people peace of mind and just a, a great foundation to get started. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. And that was episode 397 with Jamie Monty. Make sure to check her out at her website, jamiemonty.com. That's J A M I M O N T E.com. You can also follow her on Instagram. She shares a lot of great stuff on her page at jamie.monty. And again, I will link to her YouTube channel, her LinkedIn, her TikTok, everything in the show notes for this episode. JessicaMorehouse.com slash 397 is where you can find all of that, including some of the great. Um, you know, downloadables and her course. So you can check that out later. And just a reminder, if you did want to learn more and sign up for her course called Chill Books, all you have to do is go to jessicamorehouse.com slash chill books and use my code Jessica to get $50 off. Another thing I want to bring up just because we were talking about it after I recorded the episode, she's like, oh, she mentioned this just in case anyone wants to learn more about sales tax or just doesn't understand or whatever because it is a very complex um, thing. And she was like, you know, when I was starting out, I was trying to find an accountant to just talk to me about sales tax. And some of them would be charging crazy fees, like $800 an hour. So there is actually a resource called the GST HST rulings. And it's a phone number for kind of technical inquiries. And it is just 1-800-959-8287. But I'm pretty sure it'll just come up if you Google GST HST rulings. But that is a direct line to the CRA. So you can talk to them and ask your questions about sales tax specifically.
So for next week, I've got a very special episode for you. No guest. It's just me. And I have not done a solo episode in a very long time, at least a year, if not more. And I'm going to do just audio only for this one. And I'm very excited. It is I'm just gathering all the questions that have been submitted via, you know, Instagram, my newsletter, YouTube, wherever I've been getting a lot of great and specific questions. So you can look forward to that next week. But I'm going to tease who's going to be up the following week. I'm very excited because big fan over here. I've got Brian Preston on the show. You may be familiar with him already. He is the host of The Money Guy Show. He's got a YouTube channel, amazing podcast. He's been doing it for a many, 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 many years. And I think the reason I like him is he really is just like no, no BS, basically, is how I would say, but in a nice, friendly way, you know, not some of those other experts out there that are no BS, and they're just kind of mean. Um, he is so knowledgeable, and he has a book coming out, which I will be giving away. Also, I should remind you, in case you're new to the show, or you just forgot, I'm giving away a ton of books that are featured on this season of the show. So if you want to enter to win, just go to jessicamorehouse.com slash contest to do that. But that is who is going to be on the show, not next week, but the week after. And then I've got a bunch of other amazing guests to kind of wrap up this season by uh, June 5th, which is very, very exciting. And then it can take a little bit of summer break. But then uh, that also freaks me out that summer is summer's coming too quickly. That's not I, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for that. But anyways, that's what's going on. And I just want to say a big thank you for listening as always and supporting this podcast. And as always, a big thank you to my podcast team video edit by Justice Carrar and produced by mrabcanada.com. So with that, I will leave you. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm going to see you back here. I mean, just me for a fresh new episode of the More Money Podcast.